Tell me, has the phrase turn off your brain ever been used in conjunction with a good movie? You watched 2001 A Space Odyssey, you ever had your friends tell you to turn off your brain for it? F no, if you did that, your brain would light on fire. No, the whole turn off your brain phrase is used for bad movies. People, you're watching a movie. Even the most grinded movie you'll get to see isn't free from unrealistic approaches, and this is certainly isn't the first time a character conveniently escapes certain death. No, Tim! Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Good boy. Three. I know some people don't take the excuse of, it's just a movie, but sometimes, you just have to go with it as the only explanation. At the same time, if just a movie was the most valid excuse, I wouldn't have wasted my time making these videos making my own Netflix now, would I? Though again, people treat this movie as if it's the only one that made mistakes here or there, or if this is the first time any artistic licenses were made in a movie. Artistic licenses, cliches, and tropes existed before and will exist till the end of times. Some of them are lazy writing, others are just for the rule of cool. It doesn't hurt to use some suspension of disbelief, but since you hate to use it, then allow me to try a bit of that and ask the following questions. How can skeleton characters move without muscle tissues? Why didn't the toys in Toy Story 3 burn or melt when they were near the gates of hell? How can the Transformers replicate rubber, leather, plastic, and glass when they're supposed to be all metal? How can the kids in Honey, I Shrunk the Kids breathe when oxygen molecules are too large for their lungs? How is Godzilla able to live with his massive weight not crushing his body? How did Indiana Jones appear on the cliff when we never see him jump from the tank? How is it possible for mere party balloons to lift Carl's entire house? How can Spider-Man stick to walls even though he's wearing gloves and boots? How is Batman's tiny grappling hook able to lift him? What are the logistics of an economics of Star Trek they don't use money? How could Splinter learn martial arts as a regular rat? Why don't the banks fire Jeffrey despite being openly disrespectful to them? How was Jason revived by a mere lightning strike? And what exactly is Fox Quicksilver's power? Is it super speed or slowing down time? If it was super speed, then why doesn't time flow normally when he's standing still? And if it was slowing time down, then Fox got his powers entirely wrong. There's a simple explanation for that. See? I can do the same thing here. But does that affect any of the movies I referenced? But that's the thing. The audience knows they are just artistic licenses and don't put much thought into it, and they ignore it for the most part, and enjoy the movies for what they are instead of wanting for everything to be explained to them or 100% accurate to real life. We can't leave things to people's imaginations, then they might go make an internet about it. Here's a quote from one of the most influential authors of all times, J.R.R. Tolkien. What really happens is that the story maker proves a successful sub-creator. He makes a secondary world which your mind can enter. Inside it, what he relates is true. It accords with the laws of that world. You therefore believe it, while you are, as it were, inside. The moment disbelief arises, the spell is broken. The magic, or rather art, has failed. You are then out in the primary world again, looking at the little abortive secondary world from outside. J.R.R. Tolkien on fairy stories. Suspension of disbelief is an essential ingredient for any kind of storytelling. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that a magician can cut people in half without killing them. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that wrestling storylines are real. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that getting caught in an explosion won't kill you. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that you can crash through windows without hurting yourself. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that you can fall from the sky and live. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe you can blow cars by shooting bullets at them. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that humans can turn to advanced cyborgs with only their heads intact. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that cloning extinct animals is a reality. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that space travel is as simple as driving a car. Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that you can survive an electric shock. 
Suspension of disbelief is what makes us believe that you can wear a VR set for more than 5 minutes without getting nauseous. The audience must ignore the reality that they are viewing a stage performance and temporarily accept it as their reality in order to be entertained. This is totally weird. They've got it all wrong. Just because something is different doesn't mean it's bad. I'm not saying you can't make valid criticism when it's needed though. If you remember from last time, I mentioned 12 Angry Men as one of my most favorite and most influential movies of all time. But I still acknowledge the fact that it's not a flawless movie and it got some glaring plot issues. Most notably, the knife. According to many law practitioners, the act of bringing the knife to use as an evidence like how it was presented in the movie would normally result in a mistrial and jurors are not allowed to do that. But just because it used that single moment of artistic licenses, does that instantly make the entire movie invalid and ignore everything else that made it so excellent? I'll leave that for you to decide. And for a shameless plug moment, if you are interested in knowing how realistic court scenes in movies and TV shows are, why don't you go and watch Real Lawyers React by Legal Eagle, where you have a real lawyer react and deconstruct some of the more iconic court scenes and determines if they would work in real life or not. Oh my god. You can't have law students at a witness interview. It breaks the attorney-client privilege. That's just screaming malpractice! This goes back to my idea of reviewers being just too negative in their criticism. You start to wonder if they had ever enjoyed a movie without questioning anything. Let's read you. Cal. Cal is a label. Just, uh, lackluster. That's just the labels. Margin. Margin, are you kidding me? It sounds like you need penicillin to clear that up. That's a label too. These are just all labels. You just label everything. That's all lazy. You just. You're a lazy. You're a lazy. Do you know what this is? Do you even know what that is? You don't. You know why? Because you can't see this thing if you don't know how to label it. You mistake all those little noises in your head for true knowledge. Are you finished? No, I'm not finished. There's nothing in here about technique. There's nothing in here about structure. Nothing in here about intention. It's just a bunch of crappy opinions backed up by even crappier comparisons. You write a couple of paragraphs. And you know what? None of this costs you f***ing anything. You risk nothing. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Or, if they are so smart and know everything, why don't they try to make a movie of their own and see how perfect they can get? Yeah, you take it. You know, you take on the responsibility. I'll just, I'll just keep my mouth shut, that's all. What are you getting so hot about? Calm down, will you? No, don't tell me to calm down. Hey, you want to take the chair? Just take the chair. Well, that's all. Never see, see such a running. thing. Listen, you think it's funny hey, or something? forget it, fella. The whole thing's unimportant. Come on. Unimportant? Well, here, you try. No, oh, yeah, nobody wants awesome. to change. You're doing a beautiful job. Sit down. Yeah, you're doing great. There's a reason why I don't believe in a perfect movie. You can have a good movie. You can have an excellent movie. But a perfect movie? That doesn't exist. I have to tell you the honest truth as I see it. In this world, nothing perfect exists. It may be a cliché after all, but it's the way things are. That's precisely why ordinary men pursue the concept of perfection. It's infatuation. But ultimately, I have to ask myself, what is the true meaning of being perfect? And the answer I came up with was nothing. Not one thing. No matter how excellent or well made, there's always gonna be that one small goof that prevents a movie from reaching absolute perfectness. There's always going to be a writing issue. There's always going to be a background continuity issue. There's always going to be artistic approaches. There's always going to be factual inaccuracies. If the overall movie is excellent, and these tiny errors don't affect the overall structure or narrative, then I have no reason to overanalyze that one simple mistake while ignore everything else. And of course, different opinions prevent the achievement of perfectness. You can't have one single unified opinion on anything. No matter how perfect you think it is, you'll always find that one guy with a list of every issue he sees in that same thing. Maybe it's just me, but I'm perfectly fine with accepting good. I don't work with a rating system that says you're either the best or the worst, you don't get middle ground. I know that we should aim higher. We want excellency. But I don't treat good like it's an insult. If I like it anyway, why treat it like trash when it doesn't deserve to be treated that way? Maybe I'm basing it on my personal life where I've never been excellent at anything and the best thing I could do was average, so that's why I'm the way I am today. 
But in the end, we are watching movies, an evolutionary step of theatrical stage plays. Overdramatizing is a practice that has been used in stage plays since the invention of acting. For centuries, it was the norm to see our heroes on the stage in epics dealing with improbable situations and face them by overacting or exaggerated body language, to thrill the audience and to give them the sense of facing a bigger than life world, even if it was made from backdrop paintings and flimsy masks. And if you go back and look at cinema's earlier days and how it evolved over the years, they all carry the same tradition of overdramatizing the situations to excite their audience. From your epic speeches. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. And woe is us if it ever falls into the hands of the wrong people. And that's why woe is us that Edward George Ruddy died. To the knight fighting the dragon. And even down to your simple detective. You took off your gloves to touch her, didn't you? Didn't you, you son of a bitch? You touched her with your bare hands, and then you put your gloves back on. But while your gloves were off, did you open all her eyes so that they could see you? And like I said, even if you promote your movie as granted to reality, one cannot get away from adding a little bit of exaggerations to make it less boring and more attention grabbing. Not even those based on true events are immune from this. And if realistic approaches would be used, they tend to be for comedic approaches to say, Yep, Hollywood was lying, ho ho! How do they walk away in movies without flinching when it explodes behind them? There's no way! The movie industry is completely irresponsible for the way they portray explosions! Go back to all greatest movies ever made, even to the original Jurassic Park. You'll find them including what I just mentioned. Overdramatic acting, dialogue you don't normally hear in real life, broken physics. They're all there, but people turn a blind eye on them because... Greatest movies ever made equals flawless, I guess. People don't want realism in their entertainment because it exists in the real world. If you made them too realistic, you get something like many of current day games. Games that are so tedious because the developers were focused on making them realistic over fun. But these are just one man's thoughts, and I'm not really the smartest guy out there. And plus, everybody knows Phalos is the only one allowed to question movie logic. You know something, Blackbeard? You need a shave. You did this to him, you stupid Aladdin hole! Going back to the scene, some may compare it to the infamous fridge scenes from Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of Crystal Skulls, but I think the fridge is more ridiculous than escaping pyroclastic flow. But don't take my word, some people did make their theories on how it could work, including the theory of lasting effects from the Holy Grail. The only thing I would say makes the scene worse is if they did a fake out death scene where they find Owen's dead body and then he miraculously wakes up after a kiss. No, Tim. Good boy. Good boy. Hey, hold on a second. Don't I have a scientist at hand? Oh, you finally remembered? I thought I'm having the whole day off. Yeah, sorry. Anyway, a little help here? Sad to say this, but I didn't major in geology. You're on your own here. What? But you're a scientist! And? Just because I'm a scientist, you think I know everything? Eh, forget it. Why do I even bother? Hey, come here for a second. Regular volcanic ash is the one that shoots outside a normal active volcano. Pyroclastic flow is the one when the volcano erupts and shoots lava. It was a moment of artistic licensing. I have this crazy confusion. Don't tell me I have to. He's telling me how the fuck to 